Good morning, family of faith. Thank you so much for being with us today. Today's scripture comes from Psalms 34, 8. It says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for that promise. Dear Lord, we ask that you would touch every single person here in this service today. Dear Lord, we ask that you would work in our homes and our lives. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your presence here today. Dear Lord, we ask this in your holy name. Amen.
Good morning. Can you hear me now? And there will be a teacher's meeting right after church here in the sanctuary. All of you who teach any classes, please stay for a short meeting. I, I know mom's like, done, let's go. But we need to get some information to all the teachers and yay. Good? Good. Um, movie coming soon. Saw the video. Our pastor is very, very excited about this movie. Um, start inviting friends to be here and just be a part of this time together. All right. Ushers. Good morning, good morning. All right, Greg, would you please pray over and receive our offering this morning? Every time I come running, I find 
Restore and be the 
giving our transgressions. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Lord, there are numerous in this building alone that have physical situations going on right now, Father, that only you can intervene in. Father, guide hearts right now with questions. You are the great counselor. Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for forgiving us. Lord, bless our pastors who bring your message this morning. And Jesus, of course, we give you all the glory. And we all said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good to be in church. Amen. Yes. Still good to be in church. Amen. It's so weak. I just want you to remember one thing. In January, it will be just as hot as it is cold right now. There's no in-between. There's no middle ground in Oklahoma. Turn with me to the book of John, chapter 1. I want to preach on it. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And I hadn't said much about this. I wanted to show the, the film that we're going to show the 13th. Um, to give you a little background, why I want to show it is I was a youth pastor at that time in uh, Northern California. And uh, it's when all the hippies started traveling all over the United States, going to California, mostly Southern California. And the reason why they were going to Southern California is the weather's warm and nice and the ocean and people treated them good. and. So there was, wasn't hundreds, it was thousands of, of hippies. You drive down the highway and see hippies hitchhiking everywhere. And it was quite a phenomenon just to see all the young people. And of course, everybody's always asked me, well, did you let your hair grow long, grow a beard? No, I, I, I didn't. And there was a reason. My hair, much longer than what it is right now, gives me a headache. I don't like messing with it. I like the three-minute wash in the morning and go, and, and uh, so I never had long hair. 
I have grown a couple of beards. They haven't been much bigger than this. But uh, there was a little newspaper that came up, came through there, and uh, Chuck Smith was pastoring a four-square church, which uh, their doctrine is exactly the same as the Assemblies of God, except they just appointed pastors. They, didn't, they never voted on them. And Chuck Smith was pastoring this little church. And uh, that's uh, pretty much where the story started. And his daughter had an encounter with the hippie. And anyway, the hippie came to the house. And uh, he turned out to be a great preacher. And the next thing you know, uh, and it's funny, you'll see it. The congregation had a response. It was quite a unique response to hippies coming into the church. And, and uh, the end result was uh, Time Magazine said it was the greatest move of God in American culture history. And they had a big article about, about it. Uh, Greg Landry uh, pastors one of the largest churches in Southern California. And he actually got saved in that meeting. Chuck Smith built a couple of new churches. And uh, how I fit in all of that is all those leftovers that would want to travel north would come up by where we were at. So I kind of felt like I knew what was going on because I'd talked to them and there was a place called the Lighthouse Ranch where uh, they were trying to train hippies and, and whatnot. And so I kind of felt like I knew about what was going on. Yeah, we were there, Pirates Cove, got saved, got baptized and to me, and I've told some of this, and they say, well, it was inspiring to you because it's a part of your culture, it's part of how you grew up. But, uh, and maybe, it's, maybe that's all it is, but uh, I think it will inspire you to do something for God like you've never done before. Take a chance, invite somebody to church. I think, um, I think the biggest problem uh, is getting people just to invite people into the church. And uh, you know, this is really a great church. We got a lot of just great people in this church. And We've had issues and struggles just like any other church. But this is a great church. And if everybody here just worked on one family, uh, I'm going to tell you something. We could double the number in this church. We could double the number by Christmas. And that's, it's just that simple. And you'll see that when you watch the movie. But it's very well put. You're going you're gonna to be excited. <laughs> I'm projecting. <laughs> I was excited watching it. You're going to get excited. All right, let's read the scripture. First John 1, uh, start at verse 43, and it reads like this. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip, and he said to him, Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip and Nathanael said to him, We have found him whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? 
Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said of him, Behold an Israelite in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I, give, uh, you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? Well you, well, you will see greater things than these. And he said unto him, Most assuredly, I say unto you, Hereafter shall you see the heavens open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Would you bow your head with me and let's all of us pray right now. Father in heaven, we thank you for your faithfulness unto us. And uh, we pray right now the blessing of God upon this message. Touch our hearts that we might receive. Uh, speak to us in ways we've never been spoken to before. Make it clear and easy to speak and even more clear to hear. I pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Now, Nazareth is about 50 miles north of Jerusalem. And it's about 15 miles from the Sea of Galilee. To give you a picture of where Nazareth is in relationship to Jerusalem. Bethsaida and Magdala and Tiberias and Capernaum is within about a 15 mile region of each other. So when you talk about the ministry of Christ, by and large it was in that probably a 25 mile radius is where he developed his ministry and where he preached to people and where conversions took place. A lot of what we read, we read about Jerusalem, but he went to Jerusalem on feast days and then came back home. He went to Jerusalem to be crucified and of course ascended after the resurrection. So this one little area on the map is where really the life of Christ uh, found its life and found its uh, beginning. As a matter of fact, uh, if you think about it, uh, Mary Magdalene came from Magdala, that little town uh, right on the edge of, of Galilee. And, and so all these people are really, really, really close. But the Jewish people, by and large, held that area of the country in low esteem. It was not looked at as a, uh, as a place that you'd want to go and dwell or live. You know, you've heard people say, well, when I retire, I'm going to go down to such and such lake and I'm going to live there and this is where, this is where I'm going to make my new home when I retire. Nobody, nobody in Jerusalem said, when I retire, I'm going to move to uh, Capernaum or Bethsaida or Nazareth or any of those towns. Nobody wanted anything to do with it. And no, I'm not really sure 100% why they all felt that way. But I would say this. I would say that probably it was because there was a class difference. The people in Jerusalem were more affluent, educated, and uh, the Jewish hierarchy was there, and the, the Roman government was there, and there was a lot of money there. And when they looked up to Nazareth, what they saw was they saw, uh, for lack of a better way to say it, just a, what we would call, there's just a bunch of hillbillies up there. and. Uh, we're not much interested in going there, and we'll just uh, uh, not keep catching fish and sending them down. We'll eat them, but well, we sure don't want to be there. But uh, the Jews, by and large, didn't look at that as a place 
with much esteem, lower class people. And so when Nathaniel mocked in this mocking question, uh, you know, when you first read that, you think, well, it, come, it should. I mean, that's the way they thought. But what they didn't, re what people don't realize is that he was foreshadowing what Jesus was going to go through when he was crucified and tried in Jerusalem. You see, he was mocked. He was made fun of. It's, a, it's an amazing thing when you think about it. How that somebody who did so much good could receive so much criticism and so much uh, mocking and so much made, being made fun of. But Nathaniel was uh, prophetically saying uh, this is going to be a, a troublesome time for Jesus. That's just the way it's going to work. I, I don't know about you, but you know, it seems like everywhere Christianity is preached. And if you truly try to live the Christian life, where there seems to be a lot of making fun. Well, you're a Christian, you know. Uh, you, you don't have anything better to do but go to church on Sunday. And, you know, and I, I've had a lot of people say I've invited them to church. And I've had people say, hey, you know, I'd rather mow my yard than go to church. And hear some people sing out of a songbook and, and talk about something that happened in an old book that's dead and gone. And and it's uh, full of mysteries and I don't understand it and, and make fun of the, the church because of uh, the way we conduct business in the church. Well, it happened to Jesus. Uh, it started with Nathaniel. It happened to Jesus before he went to the cross. I, I think as they marched him down the Via Della Rosa and they were making fun of him and as he hung on the cross. And I think one of the things that strikes me is when they pointed their fingers at him and said, well, you saved others, save yourself. And they, uh, they, had a, they had a lot of sport with Jesus. And, but yet that same group of people saw people raised from the dead, healings take place, leprosy disappeared, lives being changed, people being transformed by the presence and power of God. And I thought, it is an amazing thing to me how at the snap of your fingers, how all of this can change uh, if the crowd goes against who you are and what you've done. Well, they were against Jesus and that's the way it was. And you know, uh, Paul writing to the church at Corinth uh, said in verse 27, 127, he said, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the strong and the wise. And, you know, man outside of the church will never understand preaching. You know, man gets up to preach, and I tell people, you know, they say, what do you do? Well, I'm a preacher. And I've had a lot of people say, well, you do something else besides that, don't you? I mean, is that all you do, just preach on Sundays? And, and uh, that couldn't bring much uh, satisfaction to you. Uh, do you have a business? Uh, uh, what's your skill? Where are you, where are you at in life? Because the world looks at the church and they see preaching and Bible study as something foolish and unwise and it's just not necessary. There's a lot of other things that's necessary, but going to the church and hearing that is not very necessary. The other thing that came to my mind is, is it seems like the early church, if I think maybe to put it, uh, in a nice tone came from people who had no uh, they had no background in leadership and they were not trained and they didn't have all of the things that they had with that, that they should uh, there, there's a lot of people I just wrote four of them down you know Joseph was despised and he he, uh, he, was, he had an insight to what God was doing. His big problem was he told his brothers what, what he thought was going to happen. And so they immediately sold him and they hauled him to Egypt. And he spent a great deal of his life in prison. He ended up being the number two man in Pharaoh. Ruth, you know, uh, she was a good Jewish girl. And 
she was gleaning fields and and living a, a beggar's life. God used her, and what a great uh, job she did. Gideon is a guy that I've always looked at and probably preached too many sermons on down through the years. But Gideon led Israel's army and defeated the enemy in a tremendous battle. And without a doubt, he was the biggest coward in Israel because he was hiding and he continued to hide. When God was trying to call him, he even hid from the voice of God. David started out tending sheep and ended up being the king of Israel. So I thought, you know, uh, these disciples that Jesus called, and he called them out from around Capernaum and in that area, the, Gal uh, uh, the Sea of Galilee, that area called them out, even though they were of, of lesser degree. They rose to higher heights than any of the people that were living in Jerusalem. And my thought is, it's not how you start that really makes a difference. It's how you finish is what makes the difference in your life and what happens with your life. Because some of you are sitting out there and you're saying, well, I didn't start out very well. I started out my poor family, working class family. I started out with nothing and I've worked for 25 years and haven't got much, but I'm enjoying a life and I'm in church. Well, what can God do with me? Well, I want to tell you something. Uh, David started out tending sheep, didn't have anything, and he just kept being faithful to God, and God just kept promoting him, and down through the years, he worked his way up, he became the king. What that tells me is that as a Christian, if we come to church and just continue to work for God, be faithful to God, do what God wants you to do. Don't get discouraged in uh, discouraging times. Don't allow, uh, sometimes our physical health will discourage us and, and bring a, a sense of despondency upon us. God's a healer. God's a deliverer. He'll bring us up into place. Uh, if he took Joseph, the thing I love about Joseph is finally when he got down to the end, he learned not to say much about himself. And when his family came in begging for food, he went in and instead of cracking the whip and having them beat or their heads cut off uh, for all the things that they had done, he never said a word. He says he went outside the chamber, walked into the back room, and because it was his own family he hadn't seen in 30 years, he began to weep and cry. He didn't know if they was alive or dead, and he wanted to do something good for them. You know, God can use you in anything or any area of life that you, uh, uh, that you are in now. He can raise you up to that place where God wants to put you, and you can do great and mighty things. It's not your beginning that matters. It's how you finish. Now... Nathaniel's question is more than sarcastic. He's assuming that nothing good could come from Nazareth. When he heard the when he heard the word, come and see. I found the Messiah, the Christ. Where's he from? He's from Nazareth. And that's when he made the statement. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? By the way, Nazareth at this time was a town that run between two and three hundred people. We don't have a town around here that small. It was just a wide spot in the road. I don't know if they had a grocery store. You know, we we look and we try to judge a, a place. We had a, a young man looking for a church, and I remember his wife said, well, we'll take any church as long as the town has a Walmart in it. Hello? Well, if God sends you to a place, that's where you go. Jesus 
started preaching in Nazareth. Nazareth didn't have a Walmart. They didn't have any marts. It was just a little town. A lot of people were in and out. They worked uh, other places. I thought uh, I was a youth pastor and I was driving kind of a, I don't know, it was a fairly nice car. It was kind of a clunker, but we come home to see mom. Evidently the car wanted to stay in Oklahoma. It blew up. So it's still here. I went down and bought another car. It wasn't much better than the one that blew up, but I knew it was good enough to get me back to my mission in life, and that was being a youth pastor and working, and we stopped in some little town in the desert there in California. I tried to think of where it was at. I can't remember exactly the place. It was a fairly large gas station, and that's back when you pulled up and somebody come out and put gas in your car and somebody else had pulled a dipstick out. Remember those days? And then they had some young kid putting air in all of your tires and, you know, and they'd check and they'd show you your oil. I got out of the car and the guy's pumping gas in his old car. And he looked at me and he said, I'm going to tell you something right now, sonny boy. He said, there ain't no California jobs for you Okies. If you're smart, you'll just turn this thing around and go back home where you belong. I think I'll have a drink of water on that one. California's filling up with you Okies. We're sick of it. I thought, I just want gas and I just want to get out of here. He was an old guy. He meant every word he said. Because I think I was around Bakersfield. Bakersfield used to be called Little Oklahoma. I suppose every poor Okie that ever could get a tank of gas that could get a job drove to California. He'd probably seen every kind of riffraff and every problem under the sun. I'm not, I'm not sure what all uh, was going on in his mind, but I know one thing, he sure didn't like me but uh, he wanted me to go back. But my, my calling, my home was in California. And he didn't understand any of that. But I, I think the comparison, when Nathaniel started listening to what Philip said about Jesus, he's from Nazareth. We don't need anything that those people from Nazareth has to say. That's a poor little hick town. They have got nothing going on. You need to just go back where you belong. And so when you read, you'll find that Nathaniel was really a good man. But he was self-made. He wasn't good because God was in him. You see, sometimes people by nature are better than others. Now, what God did for me was he made me a good man because he changed me from the inside out. If I wasn't a Christian, I would not be the kind of guy you'd want to run around with. But because I am a Christian, I will have your back until Jesus comes because that's my nature now. I'm just... I want to be just like Christ. I want to be just like him. But Oklahoma was full of poor people going to California. 
Matthew 5, 1 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Well, Nazareth had a bunch of poor people. They were poor in spirit. But I thought about this thing that happened with Dr. Martin Luther King. And I don't know if it's interesting to you, but it was to me. But about 50 years ago, Dr. Martin King, Luther King said, I'm going to have a good news campaign that's going to bring uh, a good news to the poor people of, of America. He got all of his people together and they had their conferences and they started promoting. And you know, sometimes if you just promote something right, you can get people to come out. People will come if you promote it long enough and hard enough and put enough money into promotion. There's probably a lot of people went and seen what's the, what's the new movie? Um, uh, Barbie? What, what's the name of that? Hmm? Has anybody seen that movie? You're all older. You're too old to be seeing that movie. You should know better than to go put your money into that movie. But they promoted it. I heard this morning they had almost 100 million people went and watched it. Somebody's liking it, but if you promote something long enough. But anyway, they had, the, they had their conference, had over a million people in Washington, D.C. And I remember what he preached on, because I got, wrote it down. He preached on God's economy, racism, and the Vietnam War. And I was curious about all three of those things. One is because in God's economy, he will never owe you a dime. You pay your tithes, support the church, and God said, I'll bless you. I'm committed to blessing you. Period. And I've had people say, well, I, I can't afford to pay tithes. My response to that is I can't afford not to pay tithes because tithing invokes the blessing of God. He actually, Martin Luther King actually preached that. He talked about racism. <laughs> At that time, there probably was a little bit more racism than there is now. Maybe there's more now than I realize. But then he talked about the Vietnam War, about uh, we're, we're in a losing battle. We're fighting a war that we didn't want to win, so it's, might as well get out of it. But uh, there was over a million people that were poor in spirit. And one of the things that Martin Luther King said was, he said, they came poor, but they left full of faith and full of the presence and power of God. Because I heard him give an altar call and I heard him pray. And, you know, I believe people did respond. And I thought about this. And, you know, I'm putting this message together and I thought about this and I thought, there are times as Christians when we feel poor because the devil is in the discouraging business. He's in the business of taking the goodness of God and putting a damper on it to make sure you don't receive the blessings of God and the things of God. And I've asked the question, and I know you probably have too, can anything good come from my life? I remember when I was contemplating on giving my life to God. I don't know how you did it, but I told Molly, I said, I'm going to go to church today, and I'm going to walk down that aisle, and I'm going to give my life to God. She said, don't do it if you're not serious. I said, I'm serious, because the life I'm living now is going to kill me, and I'm not getting anywhere, and I can't control myself, and I need help, and so I'm going to go to church. I'm going to tell you what, people will say, oh, we just need to have the right kind of preacher. That preacher couldn't preach a lick in the middle of the road if his life depended on it. He couldn't tell a good story. He was up there, and he quoted a few scriptures, and I'm sitting back there in the back thinking, I wish he would shut up because I want to get saved. When he got done mumbling around and preaching and talking and he had everybody stand, I got up and walked down the aisle and I got saved. I went over there and I knelt down and I prayed and I said, God, I am a sinner. 
uh, can anything good come from my life? Well, it couldn't come from my life living the way I was, but I knew it could come from my life if I made a change in my life. And so I was poor in spirit, but I had uh, a belief, but I had no life, spiritual life in my, uh, I knew that needed to change. Can anything good come from someone who struggles with the things I do? Now, I never hang my shingle out as a counselor. Um, I've counseled hundreds of people and in the old church, we had a lot of people come through there and I counseled with them. And one of the things that all of them had in common was, well, I call myself a Christian, but I've got issues in my life. I have thought patterns that I can't get rid of. I have little habits that I can't get rid of. Can't seem to change it. Can't seem to get get by. I don't. I don't know. I've tried to put a rock on it, and I've tried to uh, dismiss it. But all of a sudden, boom! It'll come up. Most of the time, things that's happened to you in your childhood will spring up into your life as an adult. And it will magnify itself and it will blow up sooner or later as, a, as an adult. That's why parents, you've got to raise your children right. They need correction but not beat. You have to take care that they're, they're talked to and treated right. You have to put a certain foundation in that child as it's growing up. Or when they hit a certain age, they'll blow up. And that's a, that's a struggle that... Uh, you'll deal with later. Deal with it now or deal with it later. Nevertheless, I talk to a lot of people and I would just sit, give them this word. It doesn't matter how many times that bird flies over your head. If you don't allow it to build a nest in your hair, you don't have to deal with it. Thoughts that come into your head, you need to let them go out the other side. I don't know what you're dealing with, you know, a lot of times for men, it's pornography. A lot of times for women, it's jealousy. But I want to tell you what, let that thought go in one side and fly out the other because you don't want to entertain it. You don't want to live with it. You don't want to promote it. You don't want to try, try to stop it yourself. Just, don't, just do not allow it to get a hold of your life because sooner or later, you'll blow up if you try to control it yourself. What, what, what are we going to do? Well... I think, and I'm going to say one more thing in relationship to that. Can any good thing come from someone who's made as many mistakes as I have? Have you ever heard that before? Have you ever said that? I'm going to tell you, You need to understand what I'm saying. If you've made 500 mistakes, God's got 500 answers for that. I forgive you. I'm, well, I'm struggling with things. Okay. You come from Nazareth. People rejected you. You're trying to make a name for yourself. You want to amount to something in life. You're cutting every corner. You're trying to get. You're trying to get ahead. Some of it's not exactly right. I'm gonna, let me tell you something right now. God's reaching out right now. And he wants to touch your heart and your life. He, you got, I've got some things that need to be forgiven. He'll forgive it just like that. Don't live in the past. Once God forgives you of something in your life, leave it in your past. Don't keep reminding your own spirit about your failures, because if God has forgiven you of your mistakes and your uh, 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 things that you've had in your life, he will not remind you again of that mistake. He cast your sin as far as the east is from the west to never bring it to your remembrance again. If it's not God bringing it to your remembrance, who keeps reminding you of your faults and failures that's in your life? It's not God, it's the devil. And he works overtime, church, trying to make sure 
that you're miserable, as miserable as he can possibly make you. Now let me start closing this message with this. Philip found Nathaniel, and they were all from this little town, this little countryside, they knew each other. And Philip said to Nathaniel, we found him, Jesus of Nazareth. And this is when Nathaniel said, and he's being sarcastic. I forgive him for that because sometimes I'm the most sarcastic human being on the planet. I have to pray through over that all the time. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? He was serious when he said it. Well, let's go look at him. Let's check him out. It's kind of like when the new preacher comes to town. Everybody wants to hear him preach his best sermon. They all come, let's check him out. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming, Jesus said, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Now I want you to study that when you get home. But it means that Nathanael prided himself in his abilities to be righteous. See, he was under the law. He was obeying the law. Nathaniel's problem was he was self-righteous. I'm keeping the law. You know, all the Pharisees had this. When you study the life of the Pharisees, they're all, they're, they all said, well, we made the sacrifice. We was, we was here on Worship day, where were you? We sacrificed the lamb, where were you? Well, Nathaniel was in that category. He did all the things right according to the law. Everything was right about him, except he was not born again, except he hadn't had an experience with God. He wanted an experience with God, but he had no experience with God. And Philip's trying to share with him, I found the Messiah, I have found him. Trust me on this. This is the real deal. This guy has the answers. There's something different about him that I have never seen before in anybody else. Well, I guess if you saw somebody raise the dead or bring a, last, uh, a, a leper person uh, back to whole or touching somebody and seeing an instantaneous healing, maybe that would change your life too. But nevertheless, it changed Philip's life. But Nathaniel said, I want to wait and see. And so in verse 47, when Jesus saw Nathaniel coming, Jesus said to him, an, uh, an Israelite to whom there is no, <coughs> excuse me, when Jesus saw coming, Nathaniel coming, Jesus said, behold, an Israelite indeed whom there is no Deceit and Nathaniel's response was, Nathan, Nathan, or excuse me, I, I wrote it right, I can't read it right. Nathaniel asked, How do you know me? And then Jesus said, Before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree. Now, I'm going to say something. I hope it doesn't shock you because I've said this before and I've had somebody say, well, Jesus was God. Yeah. When Jesus walked the shores of Galilee, he was a man. He got tired. He got hungry. He cried. He wept over Jerusalem. He preached. He was disappointed. When they mocked him, it hurt his heart. It was all the thing, everything that you've ever felt in your life. You got to understand Jesus felt those things. And it's important that we understand that. You say, well, why is that important? 
because he's our intercessor. And when you go to God, you're not going to a God that doesn't understand you. Because when you get down and out and discouraged, God, God says, I know I was there at one time. And he'll reach down so quick and he'll touch your life. He'll touch you wherever you're at. He touched some drug addict in San Diego last night, cry, crying out to God at a street meeting. God, help me get off of these drugs. And he was very mindful and he reached down, but it says Jesus was without sin. And he'll touch you. He'll touch you at your midnight hour because he was up at midnight one time praying, seeking the face of God. Is it, do, I, do, I need to, do I need to go to Calvary? Is there another answer to the problems of the world? Do I need to be hung between heaven and earth on this cross? When you read this book, friend, I'm going to tell you something. The only difference in Jesus and you and I and our bodies is we're born after the similitude of Adam. And Jesus was born after the similitude of God. The Bible emphatically says God made a body for him. I'm telling you something right now. He was a man just like you and I, and he suffered all the things that men suffer and hurt and feel and felt. And so the gifts of the Spirit were in operation in, the, in Jesus' life. And I've had people say, well, why do we need the gifts working today when we have a Bible? Jesus was the living Word. When you look at Christ, He was the Rema Word of God. He was the spoken Word of God. But you've got the Bible today. But if the Rema Word of God relied upon the power and the anointing of the nine gifts of the Spirit to operate, to touch the lives of people. Why do we reject the gifts of the Spirit when Jesus embraced them? Oh, I'll do anything Jesus did. Well, he embraced the gifts of the Spirit. Why is there such a controversy over speaking in tongues and the nine gifts of the Spirit? It's all through the Bible. It's everywhere if you want to see it. Why, why is that such a, a complicated thing? Because here's a man that's filled with self-righteousness and he's sarcastic up to his neck because of the struggles that he's had in life and he's a little bit bitter and Philip's taking him down to see Jesus and when Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree, it melted his heart. It touched Nathaniel's heart right there. You'll never convince me that you can have everything that God wants you to have without the Holy Spirit working in your life. Because Nathaniel all of a sudden went from being what he was to what God wanted him to be. And he said, you are the Christ. You are the King of Israel. You are the Messiah. You're the one that's coming to change the world, change everything that we have battled and fought and that we're looking for. You talk about the hippie revolution and the movie that we're going to see. Those hippies stormed California with their long hair and their beards and all of that, looking for an answer that they couldn't find anywhere else. Uh, but you know where they found it? They found it in a church. They found it in a church, uh, and, and uh, old brother Smith, uh, uh, he was kind of a soft-spoken, easy-going kind of a guy. But brother, when the Holy Ghost fell on that church, there was literally scores of hippies getting saved. They revolutionized California through the message uh, of Jesus Christ can save and forgive. If he did it then, he'll do it now. I'm telling you, if he did it to Nathaniel, he'll do it now. He'll take you and change your life. You've only touched the skin, the top of the surface. Uh, you're like an iceberg. Most of you is underwater. And you've got to understand, God wants to raise you up and be a dynamic force for him. God is in this place. Uh, and God is in the business of changing people's lives. He wants to change your life this morning. Amen. Stand. 
Stand to your feet if you would, please. Every head bowed, every eye closed. God's in this place this morning. God wants to do some things for you today. How many here just by lifting your hand say, Preacher, I need God to do something in my life this morning. Slip that hand up right now. Yes, 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 yes. Almost every hand in this building was raised. Glory to God. Let's pray about that first. Father, I thank you first of all that Jesus came and died on that cross. I thank you for this book we call the Bible. It is perfect. And Lord, I, I know that our church needs revival. We've got a lot of issues and a lot of, we're struggling about a lot of things. But just as sure as Nathaniel, when the Holy Spirit moved, recognize Christ as the Son of God. Help us recognize you're the answer to every problem we face. None of us are perfect, but we're serving a perfect God. Every hand that was raised, I pray right now, the touch of God would come on them in a way that they've never been touched before. Hallelujah. Sing that. 